episode number seven, Estonian and Golo. We're speaking to uh, Sergeant Major SW4E. He's from uh, one reconnaissance commando, later regiment. A living legend. He doesn't say it, but I say it. Yes, we were talking about your operations uh, in Angola in the last one. You had a thing we going with the paratroopers, as well as another operation where you got, I wouldn't say ambushed, but you got discovered and you been had to evacuate three wounded men. So now we're still in Angola in a different operation. Can you tell us further? Yes, uh, just for interest's sake. Um, in, in, in the initial phase uh, of special forces, most of the operations was done by one recce in specific Bravo group. Uh, Alpha group were the guys that were more interested in parachuting. So they were fortunate to do show jumps and all the funfair and, of course, not deploying. One of them probably going to find me afterwards <laughs> if they hear this clip, but that was the reality. So Bravo Group was the guys that took most of the brunt of the war. Uh, and then, of course, five was up at Ondongwa, which is in the northern part of Bangladesh, uh, part of Namibia. And then four were down in Langaban. There were guys with operational experience there, but a lot of them missed the war uh, because they completely qualified in a different direction which is attack divers uh, they were using as um, coxswains to deploy us. And that we will come to that operations. And then uh, they did a lot of training in Langabon, southern part of uh, Cape Province. Yeah. So not there by their own doing that they missed the better part of the war. It was just they qualified in a different direction. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we this Bravo group inside one reconnaissance uh, yeah. regiment, which were actually deploying in the bush all the time. Yeah, and I think I did mention it once before that when they counted all the fit and ready operators between the three at that state regiments, they could only master 50 in total between the three units altogether. Uh, so, yeah, and that's why you were uh, used over and over and over again, and that's why you were eight months a year in total. You were gone. You weren't in Durban. We were stationed in Durban, yeah, just to give you an idea of the reality. And that carried on for 10 years. Yeah, well, and, It could and, not have been good for marriage or for long-term relationships with a female. I just don't... Yeah, it's, it's, no... It's, I decided I made a cold-blooded decision. I'm not going to get married. I'm not going to have children while I'm there. Although I had a beautiful girlfriend. We'll show a picture of her later on. <laughs> yes, she's actually, in, uh, she's actually in, in episode five. I've put a picture in and out, the explosives one. Uh, because you were talking about explosives that you could put a name on and then you shoot it out on a, on a steel plate. You were talking yes, about something yeah, like that, and then Michelle. I asked you if, uh, if you perhaps did make the name Michelle. Yeah. And then I'm not sure if you actually answered me or ignored me. No, but, I never uh, think that romantic. I'll pick a picture of her <laughs> in there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we can carry on our two other low profile operations. For me, it was low profile. We deployed, it was also the first and last one. We one reconnaissance also from Bravo Group. We deployed uh, far north of um, Ondongwa. Ondongwa is in the northern part of Mambulat, which is the northern part of Namibia. Uh, again, the tactical HQ there from uh, uh, from the infantry side, not from special forces, were keen to know what's happening in that area because they had no info whatsoever, what is happening there. Nobody has ever been deployed there, and this is internal, it's not external, so it's in Namibia. So they ask us to deploy and it with that one photo we can put in here, uh, where we were in uniforms, beret, Dawifuri's team. Dawifuri was an excellent officer, 
strong bold guy, strong legs. Uh, he was good in uh, one or other taekwondo style. Um, so he could walk. So we what we did, we deployed with two uh, F1 Ford vehicles, civilian vehicles, and we were dressed in, in South African uh, Defence Force class. Yeah, that was the, the the second time ever. What if, yeah, first time ever that we were deployed in Namibia. Never ever again thereafter. So what we did with these vehicles, we decided to put grease on it. So, uh, our theory behind that is where we drove, it will pick up the dust of that specific area and it will be a natural camouflage. Uh, that was interesting. <laughs> we had, so as we stopped, we would go, uh, as we got further and further north, we would stop at a crawl. A crawl is this where the locals will be. They would be fenced in by wooden droppers, and they, they will have two or three, five huts inside. That's what we call a crawl. And then we would stop there, get information. And I remember we stopped there at uh, one of these crawls, and one of the guys, the youngster, come and he talked to us, and he was leaning against the vehicle there. <laughs> and whoosh, there he was on his back. <laughs> he hit the, the deck because now, of course, he was lying against the crease. And... <laughs> That was that. I'm smiling that, about that. <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine. <laughs> uh, and yeah, it's that team at the bottom there. That'll be free. Yes, oh, your switch signaling. You started talking about it. Yeah. So it's they, is right. If the guy right in the center is Darby Furi, and on his right uh, is Jay Z Erasmus, which I talked about in a previous operate, uh, operation. And uh, yeah. I'm somewhere there, I think, at the bottom, second guy from the left, or if you look at, at the photo like that. Uh, anyway, then we, I can't remember how many kilometers we drove with the uh, F1 Fords. Of course, we didn't drive any on any existing tracks. I didn't remember there's no roads there. There's only, there used to be two square pikes. Uh, yeah, and we we didn't drive on that because we were afraid of landmines uh, that would have been planted by Swapu. Uh, so we, after about two, three days of driving, we parked the vehicles. We left, I think, two guys behind. I think it was Johan Roots, one of the guys there, and another guy we left him with the vehicles and we walked another two days. Now, a guy like Tawi Furi, he can pick up the pace. <laughs> so it wasn't like a quick 10 case. You would walk starting early morning, have a quick break somewhere midday and then walk till nighttime. So we must have put 100 k's on in that two days. Plus, uh, flat terrain, easy terrain to walk in. Um, so, but once again, you're carrying quite a few kilograms of equipment. You're not the uh, just throwing around. Yeah, we were actually most of the equipment we left on the vehicle. Uh, so we were had uh, rats and a sleeping bag for two days and water for two days, actually for three days, because we had to turn around and come back again. I think eventually we called the guys with the trucks to come up more north. Because then we realized there is nothing going on there. It was quiet. There was not no tracks, nothing. And we went back and Darby Furi went to the uh, opera, uh, operational HQ for sector one. There was different sectors. That sector was sector one. Uh, Rundul, for instance, uh, was sector two and something like that. So he briefed sector one. And for them, they were so impressed with our, in such a short time that we could get that far and could do reconnaissance and come back and tell them there's nothing going on there. Uh, for them, it was unbelievable that we could have done it so quick. They thought but it would I be ask you, when you walk a patrol like that, are you in your usual formation? Which I think you call the yes. scorpion or something. 
yeah, scorpion formation, two guys in front, the scouts, then, the, uh, for instance, Davi, team leader, then one or two guys. Now it's two, four, six, and then two guys that will form the title, either side, left or right. Uh, Where would the machine that, gun be? Where would you then put the um, light machine gun, which presumably you had with your RPD or something? Normally, uh, close to the team leader. Um, yeah, and I also ended up carrying the RPD quite a lot. So I used to be more loaded than the rest of the guys. I don't know why I ended up with the light machine gun. And then, of course, not always with the radio, but a lot of times with the radio, which was heavy. Um, yeah, so they were highly impressed with our quick deployment. And, and they expect us a month later, and we within a week, because so we were back with the information and they were stunned to see how far north we went. For us, it was a very boring operation, but yeah, for them, it, it, it was a lot of information that they needed to know what's going on there. So they knew that they don't have to concentrate any infantry up to where we went, to the northern part. Um, then we can go to an operations where... Uh, I think the first one ever and the last one where we actually left booby traps behind. Um, we It was in Centra and Angola uh, where there was a lot of uh, truck movement and truck movement, it's army trucks. So there must have been a base not very far from them. It was a tar road, so they deployed us there. Um, I think if I remember correctly, by Puma helicopters and they a, a long distance from the road, so we probably walked another 50 k's or so. And then we were lying ambushes right next to the tar road. And what we did, uh, I think we were a 10-man team, which is bigger than the normal size of six or eight. Uh, we had, um, we would line line abreast linear to the tar road, and then we would put sticks in your arc of fire, so that you know, remember this is now fast moving vehicles coming past you, that you don't ca carry it away and follow it and then go over to your buddies on your right or left. So we would put thin sticks and that we know is your arc of fire. If the truck goes past that, it's the next guy. Um, so we, it, we were there for very long, and then, of course, then we had stopper groups at quite a distance from us, about a, close to a K. So they would be the early warning, and they would tell us, okay, leave this vehicle, take this vehicle. This one, the, and then they say, okay, army truck with a fuel tanker. Uh, that's what we were looking for. Uh, so we hit them, and I remember um, the the petrol tanker caught light and it went nearly hit uh, the last part of, of the ambush. Okay, so we took out that and the army truck and we had shallow uh, trenches right next to the road because we didn't know what uh, you may hit this two trucks and there's another two or three on the way and they could sweep against the road. So we decided to booby trap our trenches. Uh, so what we did, we put anti-personal mines right inside the trench, one or two. Uh, Poms it trip wires, a little bit up on the northern side of our trenches. And I think uh, Johan Roots took an M26 hand grenade and put it in a, a V-shaped tree and uh, the trip wire across uh, a small track behind us. Okay, that's where we left it in our room. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think, yeah, there was feedback that uh, we did kill a couple of guys of the soldiers, so they swept that area. And uh, of course, uh, initiated one or two of the trip wires. So that was the only time ever that we used um, anti-personal minds, because we we felt that we, you never know, we might end up in the same areas again. Uh, 
And you would all, not always remember exactly where you put these at your personal mind. So we never used it after that again. No, I get that. And I just have to explain you that uh, in Angola at that stage where you were operating, almost anything anything moving in the sense of a yeah. vehicle, a large vehicle is military. It's really not real. It's got something to do with a military. It wasn't like a booming economy with uh, civilians driving around. Yes. Yeah, it was mostly anything driving around, it was military. And then, of course, it was uh, Eastern Bloc uh, military vehicles. No Western. It was Urals, Gazes, even Scania trucks. Uh, You use these things. uh, What do you think of these Urals and uh, the other Russian vehicles? They were built for the bush. They could take take a punch. Um, and then, of course, a, a convoy like that would be uh, escorted by a BRDM. That was the nearly the their version of our battle. Yeah, with a 14.5 millimeter uh, cannon in a turret. Uh, so that was one of the few vehicles that was actually armored. Uh, the rest was all soft skin vehicles, not not like ours. Ours were most of them were armored vehicles. Yeah, that, that makes a difference in keeping casualties low. No, that's very true. That's very true. Okay, so so that's the only time ever which you remember where you used these uh, anti-personal lines, and never again. Yes. Yeah, we never used them again. For that matter, we never never left booby traps behind, like a bomb set or so. It was just, um, that was the ones of operation because we knew there were no locals in that area. It was very deserted, so there were no animals. So the only guys that's going to walk there is going to be uh, Fapla, soldiers from, from Angola. Could yes, be even, that's, that's yeah. within the rules of war. That, that's not a problem. Yeah. Yes, correct. Yeah. Then we can start with another operation that was also um, uh, they decided that the southern part of Angola, we identified uh, roads that's been used very often by military vehicles. It's easy to pick that up. So um, uh, Probably coming, a lot of our operations come from Minister of Defense or a uh, commander, a chief commander of the army, mostly. Uh, so they decided these uh, roads need to be mined. Um, so we deployed, I think it was four or five different teams, uh, six in total again. So each, so we would have six up to eight mines in a team that you need to plant that night. And I, again, I must have been a youngster then at the team. <laughs> I was the guy that had the heavy part of uh, digging a hole for the landmines. Oh. And I think it was a little bit of a slip up. So they just, uh, the team leader decided, I need to plant all the mines. So, and it it is heavy work. The first one is okay. Got a lot of the ground is, a solid heart, so you know you have to hit it with a the axe and um, uh, a chisel kind of thing, and uh, that took us the better part of a night. So because then you would plant the mine, you would then indicate it on the map exactly where it is. And then we didn't have anything like no fancy GPS uh, to indicate your exact spot, but we, the road was known to the army. And then we would walk um, three, four, five k's, put the next one. So in total, you would walk up to 30 k's that night. And every five k's, you would put a mine, not always on the same track, sometimes on the one that splits and going another direction. And that was done by four or five teams. Uh, over okay, and this one, when you dig a hole, obviously the sand comes out. And then you place it inside that hole. I'm simplifying the process now. And this is in the pitch dark. And then you yeah. um, 
put the sand which which has come out of a hole you put that over it and you just i suppose scratch it with your hand so that it looks like it's there's no hole there yeah then you you blow it you put leaves on it you, you try to assimilate the, the vehicle track that was there um and that carried on for about four or five days where we will deploy they will pull us out deploy us the next day in a different area so a lot of land landmines were planted there in that specific spot Reviews, and, um, captured plant mines were, were Russian types? Or I think it, South African um, land mines? I can't remember. I think it was the Russian uh, TM, TM 4647 uh, cast uh, yeah, TNT yeah. explosives. Yeah. Well, were they any good? They were not as good as South African uh, mines. And then they had uh, uh, a safety pin that you need to pull. Once you've put it, uh... no, that that was that was the primitive mine still. You had to put a wooden, a round wooden plank, then put your mine on top of it, and then pull your safety pin out for uh, for anti lift. And then lower it into the hull. Now, of course, the reason for that wooden plate is that if that wasn't the your hull, I mean, at the bottom is not completely smooth. So it, it may just, when you put your mind without that plate, trigger uh, the anti lift. So that, that was a little bit of a tense moment. Take it like that and put it in the hull. And then, of course, you must make sure before that your fingers can slip into the hole all the way to the bottom. <laughs> so you can't let it go here on top if your fingers can't go in with the mine. Yeah, so that was uh, eight pitted, tiring. Yeah, Five I can imagine more. that. I mean, it's like, okay, but when you plant this mine, now it's armed already. It's standing on its round wooden plate and you're dropping down that hole with your dog. Are you alone there now? If you might know Only one guy. Yeah, only one guy. There's nobody next to you, close to you. All the other guys in is in uh, uh, either early warning or they would be. Nobody will be facing you. Of yeah, course, so none. You're all alone there. So now I need to know: Has there ever been any accidents with the Rhodesian guys? Yes, one or two I know about, um, but but not with us. Um, no, no, never. Uh, Except that incident we talked about where it was radio frequency that put a, a detonator and a booster off. But that was in uh, on Dongwa, not operational. Yes, it wasn't operational. I mean, I'm not yeah. just trying to, to see the scenario in my head. You people probably fly in with a helicopters, something like a Puma, which can navigate and fly quite far, very, yes. very fast. Yeah. And then they drop you. Uh, then I suppose you lie around a bit just to make sure there's nothing there. Then you form up, you move out, you reach this road, guys go to the left, to the right. You start digging with your mate who's keeping an eye. He buggers off, you um, plant that thing, put the leaves and everything on top of it, the ground. And then you move away and you, you regroup. And of course you plot this on the maps and all this behind enemy lines. Yeah, and then that night you could easily walk about 30 k's through the bushes. And then uh, the same thing, it happened for about four days. Yeah, so your, uh, what... your navigation must have been fantastic because that is really a hard place to navigate yourself. Um, and there were no GPS, of course. Um, yeah, that was... How did you do that? You just, just counted your You had to uh, look for reference points, maybe a little bit of a high ground, maybe a massive tree on the horizon uh, sometimes you could if you just walk in a general direction you could walk for about 20 minutes picking a star and only walk for that on 20 minutes not longer than that but that in general is uh, how we navigate and then and of course you have to be uh, uh, designated to navigate the rest of your follow and look around for yeah. the enemy 
Yeah, and then also uh, we uh, had each guy at a compass uh, that you had, and, and each guy had a map as well of that specific area where you're going to deploy. So with any one of them could navigate. Yeah, and with a couple of reference points on that, so which you more or less know if you see this one, okay, you are here on the map. Uh, but we didn't have any fancy... We once had a, a, a device that we could uh, communicate or track a satellite, but it wasn't practical. You could only use it about once or twice, then the battery was flat, and it was extremely heavy. And I think we only use it once or so, and that's it. Well, the old ways work. I mean, you got where you wanted to go, and you reached your targets, and you destroyed your targets. Yeah, um, and, and, and normally uh, you would know that you were right with where you are if, if the choppers come and pick you up, or uh, for one other reason, have to come there in the area. And if they fly uh, spot, spot on to where you are, you know your, your navigation was, was spot on. Okay, this is interesting to me. Perhaps we should just ask a question on that. I do recall when you and Dostein was working with Renamo and we had the parachute accident and all those explosives started raining around you. If you say two or three, I don't know. How would you call in a helicopter? Uh, let's say you've established contact now with head office. They say they're going to pick you up. by sending in the Pumas or whatever. Uh, what would happen from the time that you can actually hear that thing or see it? What, what's the procedure? Okay, what? yes. Well, what you need to do, and especially we did that quite a lot in, in uh, Mozambique, is you have to prepare an, an LZ. Now, we had a very thin, uh, racist shop. It looks like a piece of wire, but it that hooks. And on each end was a grappling you could grab onto that. So that you would put around uh, a tree, but it can't be a massive tree, but thick as your arm or thicker than that. And then you would just start sewing it off. Um, and then of course, also you have to look on the side that the chopper is gonna approach the sudden northern. You have to see if there's high trees there and you can't come from that side. I remember once, in Mozambique, we, we prepared an LZ and the chopper said, no ways. Just about a K or less to your north, there's a much better uh, LZ. And then they would fly circle until we are there. Then they would only come and drop. So what we normally then do uh, is we would, um, a lot of times, uh, first you will do communication on your HF. Uh, frequency radio, the single 30. Then they will give you an estimate time of arrival. And then you would put on your HF radio and you can, if they are about 20 minutes out, they will start talking to you. And uh, if they are about one minute out, they ask you to, to give smoke. So then you would uh, throw a smoke grenade, normally orange color, and then they will drop you will jump in and they will immediately depart again. Uh, we once had, we, we worked with the um, Impalas and Mirages. Uh, we had a small thing which we call Halo, Halo Mirror, Helio, Helio Mirror, Helio Mirror. It's square like this with a hole inside and you would look directly where you hear the plane. Or can you think where the plane is? And then you told it back and forth, back and forth. So, the, and they will pick it up, uh, the reflection from the sun. And I remember once uh, a Mirage pilot, two of them, it was high up, and they just went higher and higher as we talked to them. And we all eight of us were using just helium mirrors. And then they said, no, but we can't come closer. There's anti-aircraft down there. So it was actually our oh, helium mirrors that yeah. we saw. <laughs> yeah, it's a signal mirror. I'll put the picture here on it. You, you find it yeah. often in survival kits with pilots as well when they drop. Uh, and then it sometimes, uses the sun and it's extremely bright. You can see it 
many, many malls. Yeah, and then uh, we also had a um, daiglo, piece of daiglo. It was just like a piece of pla plastic, either uh, like the color of your shirt or yes, white. orange. Yeah, and ironically, we once tested it with the Impala pilots and they said they pick up the white one easier and at a higher distance than the orange one. So it was for us nice to, to know that before and you rather take the white one. I recall in the police, in the counter-insurgency units, we had like day gloves inside our uh, camouflage hats. And so what you do is you would just flip your hat upside down and then the day glow is on the top. Yeah. And the idea was when the, the gunships can then see who's who there. Um, how well it worked, I don't know. I do know you sweat, you sweat it a lot because it's a solid piece of plastic now, right on top of your head. I think that's where I lost my hair. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to blame somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and just for you who's watching, uh, it's probably just got about 10 years for me, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you just quickly explain, you did it in Afrikaans once and probably some way, what's the difference between an LZ, a landing zone, and a drop zone, a DZ? Yeah, LZ is, is where they physically come and land at a so few miles or so the they drop down. Yeah, a DZ could be either where paratroop, paratroopers dropped or when you do a resub like we did with the Renama, that okay. would be a DZ dropping zone, yeah. So I, I understand that. Uh, yeah. if, if this helicopter approaches at night, uh, they also didn't really add any flare or infrared. That came much later after the bush war ended, I think. Um, I know about one operation where you people were using night vision. We, we will talk about that. It was that attack on, uh, on some bridge. We'll get to that. Um, these pilots, they, they, they weren't flying with any lights on or anything. They were darkened out. They're coming just above the trees. Uh, very, very good piloting skills. Okay, we're continuing here. As you will note, I'm sure I'm wearing a different shirt. Uh, the recording is 24 hours later than what we stopped two seconds ago. That's a wonderful thing about editing. Uh, yesterday was a strange day in South Africa. Still is today. Country is burning. And we can only hope that things will go back to normal. Isra, over to you again. Uh, we, we finished with all the... Well, we finished with nothing, actually. Now we can carry on with that. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> we, we're back in uh, southern Angola. And now we start to do a certain kind of operation more and more, deploying by vehicles. Uh, this time we will deploy with... Um, it's just basically Unimox, the German manufactured, which I classify as one of the best uh, four by four uh, vehicles. Although it's, if it's a bumpy terrain, it, it tends to bump. Uh, so it's not that uh, the, the coils are not that rigid. So it, it goes like, like driving over a lot of bumps. But it, in a, it's a vehicle that can take the punch. Uh, so we deployed, the, the purpose was again to uh, train UNITA, not special forces, just in general. And they allocated about, I think about 12, 20 UNITAs to escort us. Um, and so we drove with the vehicles for quite a distance. I'm not sure how deep we were into Angola, but it was, it was in the southern part of Angola. Um, simultaneously, we had to uh, look for enemy and then ambushes and attack them. Um, we also walked in, night, in the night, and, and I remember one night we split up, and the, the challenge we had is how are we going to find each other again? because we split up in two-man teams to do reconnaissance. And uh, the idea was to RV the same night again, or during the early morning hours. So we had a challenge as how to find the other team again. 
And one of the guys came up with a brilliant idea. We had streamlight torches, quite a rigid one, with NICAD battery that you can keep on recharging. So what we did, we put an infrared lens in front. So we took the, the current one out, put that one in, and in each team there was one or two guys that had um, uh, night sight equipment, night vision. So what we did, and it actually worked brilliantly. So you would take that torch, walk to a, a tree that's very really high, and then shine the torch up into the tree. And the guy with the infrared um, night sight will pick you up 10, 12 kilometers away. It would look like if that whole uh, tree is on fire. It was unbelievable. It was like a day glow light. But yeah, even if you take that torch and you shine it into your eyes, that infra lens is so thick, you can't see anything. So yeah, so even if you shine it against the tree, there's nothing. It doesn't look like the torch is on. So that was an excellent way of, of getting back together again. And then they gave us the task. So we left the vehicles behind and with the UNITA guys, we approached a river, I can't remember the river's name, but you can't cross the river, it was quite wide. And on the other side, we had a team, one of our teams, and doing reconnaissance, there's supposed to be an army base somewhere there, so they had to locate it. So what we did, um, we had 81 millimeter mortars, so we uh, lined them up very close to the river, I think we had three pipes, can't remember how many bombs, but we packed the bombs next to the, uh, the pipes. And then later at night, I don't know what happened. Um, the enemy start firing on the other team with mortars. And, but we, we sitting on the other side of the river had a direct uh, line of sight to where they were firing, although you couldn't see them visibly, we could see from where the mortars were fired. So we changed our uh, direction of our mortars and we did a bombardment there on them. Um, and we silenced them for a very short period. And then the next moment they picked, uh, there was another, it was a, a very big army base, which we didn't realize. So we were in a hornet's nest there. So from another position, another one that we neutralized, they opened up with mortars onto our position. And Kali Kralin told us to, uh, to pack up and we withdraw. And in the uh, what do you call, excitement to get away from that specific area, uh, we left the base plate behind and I think two bombs. And the next morning when we actually uh, first light, we realized oh, we won base plate missing and we were going into an RV there lying up and then, yeah, but an hour later, here's one of the UNITA guys with the two bombs and the base plate on his head. <laughs> he arrived there. And it was um, funny how uh, they would carry equipment. For instance, uh, if we walk very far, they will have the our rack sacks on top of their heads. They walk like that. And even with that on their heads, you can't keep up pace with them. They're incredible fast walkers. And they can walk for hours. Yeah, so yeah, the guy picks up with our base plate and, and our mortars. And um, also a funny thing that happened with that trip is that they resupplied us on the way to, to our target area. So myself and I think two UNITA guys took a, a, a Unimog and we drove about, a, a, it's about a day's drive. Uh, thick terrain, difficult terrain. Uh, so they resupplied us and I took the, I can't remember if it, the resupply was done by, by parachute. Could have been. Uh, so I took out all the stock, I put it on a vehicle and there was one or two bags which I hidden away on a tree. I don't know why. 
Okay, late that night I was back at the camp and the next morning everybody was happy about the resup and something warm like a steak. And then HQ asks us, why are you not responding on your letters? And the guy said, but there's no letters here. They said, yeah, it was in the back. So it was in the back which I left behind. And what I had to do, I have to drive a day back. <laughs> Me and the same two Unita guys. One day back, and I, luckily I found the bags again. So I need the next morning I arrived back with the letters. <laughs> so I wasn't very popular. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay, well, basically, you know what? I actually get quiet for nine minutes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, will, I, will, I will put in a picture of a Unimog here. I have a few which you've seen to me, the ones with the guns and the machine guns and things on them. Just so that yeah. people know what they look like. It's a certain age, of course. You still find these Unimogs, fantastic vehicles. And I don't know if you've seen it ever, but in the old days before we had, well, even today, the, the navies of the world, they use searchlights. Uh, to communicate with each other. And sometimes they yeah. shine this thing right into a cloud. And I will try to find a picture, but it's rare. If somebody has a picture like that, just to send it to me, we can show people. It looks like that cloud is on fire. And yeah. you can actually see it right across the horizon. So it's interesting to me how you lit the tree with your torch, which must have been active infrared, and then the passive infrared to yeah. pick it up. That's, that's very interesting. Can I ask you, uh, when it's perhaps unfair after all these years, this base plate of the 81 uh, mortar as well as the two bombs, as I correctly remember, those things are actually quite heavy. Uh, so for this guy to, to carry this on his head, this must be yeah. heavy. <laughs> it, it is heavy. Um, and then, of course, the two bombs as well, which is not that heavy, but after it was quite a distance. It must have been 20 k's plus. It become very heavy. Yeah. So yeah. So, he, so when you people were working with Unita, I've had a guy from the Afrikaans videos asking me, what is Unita Special Forces? You'll recall you did tell us about Swap, who is now the enemy special forces, but were you people always working with Unita Special Forces or normal Unita? Uh, no, what were we, they anyway? Uh, but, normally it was allocated to us by and Dr. Zavimbi would uh, select him himself, so he would select his best guys. And they were all always tasked to make sure, even with their own lives, nothing happened to us. And, um, yeah, so uh, the UNITA Special Forces, we only worked with once, and that was another op where we deployed at three months, where we trained them. But, yeah, you could immediately pick up. They, they are bright, clever, switch on. Yes, so that's I, the ones which you also trained on the use of these uh, strange explosives. Yeah. The ones which, which we, will, we will get to that. Jonas uh, Savimbi, perhaps you should just tell people who's, who's Dr. Savimbi. They yeah, might Dr. have forgotten, you know, it's a long time. Yeah, ago. He, was, he was the leader of UNITA. He was a Christian guy, uh, pro-Western, mm, uh, the same as FNR. Well, they were both... Uh, Pro-Western. If not, I was dis disturbed after. There was actually an uh, How do you say it? They did an attack on MPLA with the, uh, the assistance support of the South African Defence Force. That was in 75, 76. Yes, it and was then, way north. I came out of the year on the road and route. Yeah. Back. What's interesting about them is they, they were armed with M16 rifles. Not the yeah, and, I saw in a few pictures the other day. Yeah, and, it, and, and the coordination of the attack was, was done by the Defence Force and specific hour that the African Defence Force would attack. Some of the older guys will give us more detail on what happened there. So they were two, three hours late, FMLA, and then they uh, very uh, brave attack Impel a sort of by themselves, and they were completely annihilated. What is, what is that word? 
destroyed. Why do you ask me? I can speak English just as well as you. We <laughs> were destroyed with the text stop. Yeah. Uh, uh, most of the time. a huge victory, which it really was because we did stop him. If we didn't stop him, but that price of FNLA would have been in Rwanda, uh, the capital, and you know what? The oil fields would have been gone and history would have changed. Yeah, and, and they um, mostly by the Stalin models. Uh, yes, the one twenty-two millimeter Russian uh, lo rocket launches. Mostly, uh, I, I spoke to an army colonel. He was in the signals in those days. He was actually the signal officer for the entire uh, Savannah operation. I'm trying to get hold of him to bring him here. He's, he's, he's of course quite quite old now. If he's still alive, and if anybody knows him, then uh, I'm not going to mention his name. Just just telling to to get hold of me. I'll leave my email address here. Because he told me very interesting stories of what happened there, because he was actually there, yes. I believe. And there were a couple of these 5.5 pounders or whatever these, these guns, which were, which were army as the old Second World War ones. One or two of them were abandoned. And then they had to, the South African group then had to escape. And they were really close to the Congo. They were very, very high in Angola. Yeah. So they made it to the beach. But sadly, there was no one waiting on the beach. And so the Air Force flew them in with, uh, sorry, the, the Navy, and one of these small wasp helicopters, I understand, and then they got them picked up with that almost one by one and flew sure. them out. It, it's really, a, a, there's a book waiting to be written. Yeah, that was interesting. That part, so yeah. I would love to speak to the old guys if they, if they actually can tell us more about that, because the uh, yeah. great yeah. operation. That, so that was, just to summarize, UNITA and FLA. So UNITA was pro, pro Western, and they were play a big role uh, at, in the attack of Kwitukanawal. Uh, they were very much involved there. Before that, they were more involved with only special forces, but there they got involved with the actual attack. Uh, six one uh, mechanized brigade or mechanized, not the brigade. Six one was like, a, yeah, they were never brigade size, they were much smaller yeah, than that. Battalion, yeah. six one battalion, That's yeah. The Homer guys, the one where uh, your friend Ringo's husband used to, to be Correct. the chaplain. If there's somebody here who wants to listen to that, well, it's an off recalls, I'm sorry, but they uh, well, well worth it. You can understand off recalls in any way, go listen to that. The bad video where we speak to the widow of a, of a chapter of 6 1 mechanized battalion. Yeah.